Hi, I'm Beck Mills. I, um, I'm a soft tissue therapist based in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. When people ask me why I got interested and what started all of this for me, I just I think back to 2009 when I first stumbled across a patient who suffered from fibromyalgia. This patient had seen 16, 16 or so doctors and specialists around Australia and spent, I think she said something like $30,000, $40,000 on trying to find answers. When she did come to the point of telling me that she travelled overseas to see a fibromyalgia specialist, I was just like, wow, that's such a long way to travel. But then she actually started to tell me about what he was treating and what he was looking for. So a little alarm bell went off inside of me and I was just like, I started to buzz. I knew straight away that hearing about chlamydia ammonia, hearing about toxins, hearing about deficiencies, you know, and hearing about all these infections and how they play a role in and why they play a role just made so much sense. Getting to the bottom of these illnesses early could save lives and I think that's really important to sort of keep in mind. Screening for stealth infections is not taught in medical school and I think it should be. This amount of information that's now available that suggests that these infections play a causal role is just incredible. Bob Bransfield, the psychiatrist, I found him incredibly interesting to talk to. Garth Nicholson, wow, what he has to bring uh, I think that these two probably, you know, hit out of the park with a lot of their research and what they've put together. The idea of the human body just being made up of microbes, it makes sense. Working in such an industry where you're exposed to so many different kinds of people and so many different kinds of pain is so challenging. Once you learn about these infections and you learn about other toxins and you learn about how the combination of toxins and deficiencies and infections play a role in some of these chronic these chronic illnesses, it just makes so much sense and you, and you feel like you need to tell people about it. It's just joining the dots. You know, it's definitely time to start changing the way that we think if we want to start beating these diseases. Well, good afternoon everyone. I'm super excited to be here today. Um, I'm also feeling a little bit challenged. Now, I'm really excited because I've got a great opportunity to talk to everyone today about some information and some insight that has been able to help me as a soft tissue therapist, reach out to some of my more complex patients. Now, I never thought I was going to be able to do this. Um, but I'm feeling quite challenged because I've got about four to five years of research to cram into the next hour. So, today's talk is going to be about the concept of stealth infections, how they play a role in pain and illness, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about how being an educated soft tissue therapist about stealth infections, we can apply this information in a clinical setting and help get results with our patients that present with complex conditions. Okay, now before I jump straight into things, um, can I get a show of hands of who in the room here identifies as a remedial massage therapist? <coughs> Great. Have we got any MSTs here? Couple. Any naturopaths, osteos, physios or doctors? Awesome. Well, I think it's fair to say that we have one thing in common. We've got a lot of things in common, but one of the most important things in common is that we all like to help people. Now, I'm going to talk briefly a little bit about the kind of therapist I am, because it may help you understand why I've travelled down the road I've travelled. Now, as a body worker, or as a soft tissue therapist, I love my job. I throw myself into my work because it gives me a purpose of life. Like, I feel like it's my meaning of life, basically. Um, I like my job because it challenges me. Now, one of the greatest challenges I face as a soft tissue therapist is coming up against idiopathic conditions. That is, conditions that we don't well understand, um, conditions that we don't like have great answers for, and conditions where we don't actually have clear treatment plans for. Before I go into what a cell pathogen is, I'm going to just draw your attention to the industry considerations. I'm going to propose the question to the audience. Um, what is a soft tissue therapist? We've all just said we're a soft tissue therapist in some kind of way. I'd like to hear from you what it means to be a soft tissue therapist. So, hands up. Please don't be shy. What's our scope of practice? What are we doing as soft tissue therapists? I think it's fair to say that collectively, as soft tissue therapists or body workers, we predominantly work with the musculoskeletal system. And we, it is our job as a therapist to sort out the type of pain, assess the sort of pain, and then try to find the problem, find the problem but fix the problem of the pain. Now it's also within our scope of practice to know how to refer and who to refer for. Um, and I think that that's really something that we need to understand and that we're going to talk about later on in this presentation. Oh, one thing, key thing. 
A lot of the systems that we're working with as soft tissue therapists include the musculoskeletal system, the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system. We do touch on the lymphatic system, and we're also working, working with vascular system. I guess with those idiopathic conditions, these are those conditions that I really personally find challenging. So I don't know if it's my OCD, but I hate working with conditions that I don't understand. So I like scratching into them. When Jimmy asked me to give me a talk, or when Jimmy asked me to give a talk on my research, he's also asked me to touch on why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, so I had a bit of a think about it, and I thought at the end of the day, talking about self infections and thinking about self infections is helping me identify, like just identify some of the underlying causes for pain. Now, I'm doing this because of emotion, number one, but my dad and my mum are all affected by chronic illnesses. So at the end of the day, it's quite challenging to be a, a soft tissue therapist, and one of the biggest challenges is patient, working with patients that we can't actually identify the source of pain for. Now, I'm re doing this research because I really like getting to the source of pain and dysfunction. And at the end of the day, I'm doing a lot of this because of emotion. Um, and emotion, I think, is one thing that's really important to understand. Now, the other thing, the other reason why I'm doing this is because I'm determined to get results. Um, it's also a nice thing to be able to work a problem out and then go home at the rest, go home at the end of the day and um, know that you've actually reached out and helped someone get through that pain. For the last four years, it feels like I've been tapping into what seems to be a, a hidden underground, and that is the hidden underground of a stealth pathogen. Now, a stealth pathogen is an infection that hides inside cells. It gets inside cells, and it can't be seen by the immune system. A stealth pathogen is a pathogen that has the potential to destroy every system of the body. Left untreated, these stealth pathogens have the potential to affect every single system and cause a heap of collateral damage. Stealth pathogens are shapeshifters. They're smart, and they can't be seen by the immune system. A lot of people ask me how I got into this kind of research. And the thing is, is that I do come from a family background where chronic illness is quite prevalent. So I've always had in my mind, I want to be able to get to the bottom of why my family's sick. And that's really important. I've also got a lot of patients that I see that have a lot of these fatiguing illnesses, illnesses that affect the brain. And I feel pretty determined to be able to get to the bottom of it. So in 2009, I come across a patient that had fibromyalgia and she had chronic fatigue. And she was like a lot of the fibro patients and the chronic fatigue patients that I've seen, but she was really determined. Turns out this patient had actually travelled across to the United States and she'd sourced out a fibromyalgia specialist that was a functional doctor. He was actually a rheumatologist. And what he did that was, un that was different from other doctors was that he included screening for stealth pathogens as part of a treatment protocol. So long story short, this patient actually presented with several of the pathogens that we're going to learn about today. And it was fortunate enough for me that I found her at a time when she was just about to start a treatment plan. So over the last 6 to 12 months in 2009, I got to see her clinical presentation change through the, through the treatment of these pathogens. So that was really cool because a little alarm bell started to go off inside my head. And I was like, wow, man, like fibromyalgia, it's something that I don't know. If anyone here in the room has got a fibro patient, they're really hard to treat. Um, pain changes, their mood changes, they come with a lot of issues. Sometimes they're really sensitive and sometimes they're not so sensitive. So during the 6 to 12 months I was treating her, I got to see her go from a mess to something quite stable. And the one thing that like really left an impression with me was the fact that her mood started to change. So that really touched home with me because I've got a dad that's pretty sick with bipolar. I was like, man, this is cool. Anyway, so I continued to do some research. Now, my research consisted of traveling around, traveling around Australia talking to patients that were symptomatic. Um, I wanted to know more about these infections, so I, I started to read up, I started picking up the phone and talking to doctors overseas, uh, Skype consultations, uh, I knocked on the MS, like I approached MS Queensland about it and said, hey, what kind of information do you have here? Um, and they really didn't want to know about that. Now, I also approached Parkinson's Australia. <coughs> Uh, and eventually, no one really wanted to know about the information that I wanted to have, like have them here. I also applied for Churchill Fellowship, so that was kind of cool, but I didn't get it, so I was pretty bummed out about it. And eventually, over the next couple of years, I was getting more and more and more information, and it just made so much sense. Idiopathic conditions started to make sense. So, eventually, 
because I had knockback after knockback, I decided to make a documentary. I thought it would be really cool if I can take all my learning and put it into a video so I could help begin to tell people about what I was learning. I took two case studies from Brisbane. I took a patient with chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia and a really lasting remitting MS. And I took her mother who also had chronic fatigue and MS with me. Oh, sorry, she had chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia with me. Over in the States, I contacted a couple of um, microbiologists interview. I contacted the rheumatologist that my first patient had actually gone over to see. Um, I also contacted, contacted a psychiatrist. Now, all of these guys were happy to have me come over and do interviews, which was fantastic. So I sat one-on-one, -on -one, conducted a few interviews, and then actually looked at how um, the rheumatologist was treating my fibro patient. So I sat with him a few days of the week, and I started to learn about what kinds of questions that he was asking in health history. I started to learn and understand what kinds of tests were being done. Now, these tests were really important because no one in Australia was able to, was, was doing them. All of the chronic fatigue patients and fibro patients that I had hadn't actually gone through any of these tests, so I just lapped it up. Uh, so, long story short, I'm currently continue, continuing to meet regularly with a lot of the Australian GPs that I've actually now found. Um, I pick up the phone quite regularly and just say, hey, how's this patient going? Even if it means that they're in WA. Uh, constantly talking via Skype. I'm often on the phone in the, to the US quite early in the morning talking to doctors over there with meetings. And um, more importantly, I'm starting to screen for these sorts of self-infections in clinical practice. So I'm actually taking a lot of my screenings and um, reporting on what patients are coming back with self-infections, which is really cool. Now this paper was written by the last gentleman that you saw, Dr. Garth Nicholson. Now Dr. Garth Nicholson is a microbiologist. That's his, uh, he's also the chief founding officer of the um, Institute for Molecular Medicine. So he is someone with a lot of experience in clinical trials, so he really knows his stuff. He was one of the guys that I wanted to nail, like I wanted to, nail the wrong word, I wanted to go over and interview him <laughs> because I thought, well, if you're going to interview him, you're going to go all the way to the States to talk to somebody, you might as well talk to someone who's been doing a lot of trials. Uh, so he has over 30 years of experience with trials. So this paper really wowed me. Basically, it identifies a lot of the infections that we're talking about today in specific neurodegenerative diseases. Now, I'm talking about Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, motor neuron disease, Lyme disease, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and then we've got some really interesting ones like bipolar, uh, schizophrenia, and one of the ones that mess you up in the head. So I would recommend Googling this one, or you can jump on my website and download it for free. Self-infections are, in general, bacterial infections. They get inside, they get inside cells, hide inside cells, and can't be seen by the immune system. So these kinds of infections are called stealth because they're hiding inside your cells and the immune system hasn't recognized that it's infected. So if the immune system hasn't recognized it's infected, it's not going to know how to fight an infection. Okay, so if I get you guys thinking about what something that's not being fought is going to be doing to the body, we'll come back to that in a sec. Stealth infections are different from other kinds of infections because they're intracellular, intracellular which basically means they can morph for number one, they can change their shape, they can change their size, and they can penetrate other cells quite easily. Some are metabolically active, and some are metabolic, metabolically inactive, so this basically means they're different life cycles. Sometimes they're awake, and they're moving around the body, and they're actually actively <coughs> hurting the cells, and then sometimes they're just asleep, and they're hanging out, doing absolutely, well, not much, they're just doing not much at all, but they're actually creating low levels of inflammation. Uh, when they're in a really sleepy kind of phase, their genetic signature is hard to find, so this is key because when that genetic signature is not as strong, they're not going to get picked up as blood tests. Okay, so stealth infections are best identified by molecular means. This means examining the DNA. Does everyone know what DNA is? It's the stuff that they use in court when they're producing evidence. Uh, they aren't picked up in routine lab tests. So this kind of process is not taught in medical schools. Med students are not taught about self-infections and they're not taught about how to treat them, let alone how to find them. So traditionally these protocols, because they're not taught in medicine, aren't used to screen people who present with chronic illness. Okay, so this is the juicy stuff. This is the stuff that applies to us as therapists. Um, we need to know about self-infections because they can lead to widespread pain. They do create disorders involving the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. They do lead to autoimmune problems. They can damage cell membranes. 
Now what this means to us as therapists is that we will see a lot of patients with self-infections that predominantly present with fatigue. They predominantly feel tired. They don't have a lot of energy. They have lost an ability to perform everyday functions. They're lethargic. Now, these guys that I see in clinic too also present with a lot of cognitive impairment. Now, this can come in so many ways. One of them is which you just saw me demonstrate before. Um, you can not think properly. Your thoughts are scrambled. Um, you, can, you have a problem with memory, and this is affecting the short-term and the long-term memory as well. And basically, you have, you have difficulty understanding the better things in life. And most importantly, you're not sleeping. If you're not sleeping, you're not healing. The most common kind of self-infection Dr. Garth Nicholson has studied uh, in his fatiguing illnesses and neurodegenerative diseases are number one, mycoplasma. Number two is chlamydia pneumoniae. And number three is Borrelia burgdorferi. So Borrelia is the cause of the bacteria in Lyme disease. We'll talk more about the infections a bit later. Now there are some co-infections that commonly pop up in chronic fatigue and neurodegenerative diseases as well. We're not talking about these guys today because they're a little bit more complicated and I don't have I don't have a lot of time to talk about much today. Uh, so we have Bartonella, Babesia, Enlichia, Anaplasia, Rickettsia and Toxoplasma. That's just a handful. Now these guys here are usually picked up through the bite of a vector. Now, vectors are ticks, they're insects. They're basically any kind of creature that can bite you and transmit blood, draw blood from you, and then, then go and bite somebody else. As body workers, as naturopaths, as physios, as osteos, as GPs, as chiropractors, as everybody who's trying to help anyone in pain. The most common kinds of conditions we're going to come across are chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia. For me, that's personally what I see in clinics. Uh, the next couple of common ones are multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, and Lyme disease. Now, in clinic, we do see a lot of rheum rheum rheumatic conditions, such as rheumatoid arthritis. And the very last one, which is super interesting as a therapist to now be aware of, are inflammatory conditions. So arthritis, neuropathies, and tendinopathies. So Stealth infections are best identified by molecular means. So again, that's the DNA testing. Uh, they're not picked up in routine lab tests. I just need to reiterate that these kinds of infections don't get picked up in routine lab tests because they're hiding from the immune system. Your immune system isn't actually registering that it's infected, so it's not fighting it. Uh, it's not producing antibodies, and the typical routine blood tests that we do do involve serology, which means antibody tests. Okay? Um, so, but the good news is that when these infections are found, they're usually picked up with those good tests, but they're treated with combination antibiotic protocol. Now, it's really important to know that people can get better when they are found to have self infections. Um, this is a great paper because it basically highlights the crosstalk between the immune system and the nervous system. This paper is a 2013 paper, it comes from Germany. Uh, I think it was published from a bacteria slash parasite research facility in Germany this year. So it's a great paper to Google if you want to know a little bit more about the mechanics between neuroinflammation and the cytokines and chemokines. So just quickly, cytokines and chemokines are proteins that coordinate the immune response throughout the body. The key finding in the study is that there's always dysfunction. Um, they've been able to find dysfunction with the cytokines and chemokines looking at conditions where neuroinflammation is present. So conditions like bacterial meningitis, brain abscesses, Lyme, they've looked at HIV and they've looked at neuro, no, neuro pain, so basically any kind of condition where there's a lot of neuropathy. Okay, so after I chatted to both the US specialists and the Australian specialists, I've learned that you can catch a self infection by someone coughing and sneezing on you. You can catch a, a self infection through the bite of a tick. You can, well, your mum can actually pass it down to you through the utero. Uh, you can actually probably pick up some of these through the great acts of sex as well. So sexual transmission is a pretty important one to be aware of. However, there isn't a lot of research to date at this point in time that says that it is. But in theory, it happens. And we've been able to see a lot of the case studies that we're tracking and following with kids that actually present with a lot of the infections. So we're kind of putting one and one together. Um, so we're, we're seeing males that have actually been diagnosed with it no females with it, and then once we've worked out that they've had a baby together, we've worked out that the infection has actually been passed with from male to female. Uh, blood transfusions. Infections have been found at blood banks. 
which is something really scary. I first stumbled across a Red Cross case a few years ago. Um, Red Cross actually went to one of the labs and said, hey, we've got Lyme in some of our blood. What are we doing about it? What do we do? And so that's pretty crazy to think about it. In theory, needle sharing is another way that you can pick it up as well. So back onto that blood bank thing, I don't mean to scare anyone. Blood banks are aware of cell pathogens. However, they're not screening for them uh, because we have a government that isn't really saying that they're here. We'll talk more about that in a little bit later. Back to mycoplasma and chlamydia pneumoniae. Now these are two examples of really common airborne pathogens. So when someone coughs on you or sneezes on you and they have an active infection, that's one way of catching this, these two. Garth Nicholson actually told me that 7% of the population present with mycoplasma. So that's, that's a pretty big figure, I think, for someone to have mycoplasma. Chlamydia pneumonia, Dr. Charles Stratton, he's a microbiologist that I saw in Vanderbilt, he actually commented and told me that probably by the age of 50 or 40, between 40 and 50, 20% 20 of the population will have it. Uh, these two infections love blood and they love nerves. So a lot of our patients will present possibly with self infections that have attacked the central nervous system or pre uh, present with vasculitis, problems to do with the vascular system. They also have the potential to destroy, or not destroy, but get in and play havoc um, with a lot of the other systems as well. Now Borrelia, or commonly known as Lyme disease. I put this one in today because it is one of the top three stealth infections that we find in a lot of our fatiguing illnesses. The most common kind of vector for Borrelia in Australia, according to research, is ticks, our ticks. Uh, however, in theory, anything that can bite you has the potential to pass this, this bacteria on. Now Borrelia is a spirochete. It's spiral shaped. It's a cousin of the syphilis family. It's also passed through, well it's also passed congenitally, sexually, through blood transfusions, IV drug use and in theory tattoo needles and uh, sharing tattoo needles and having tattooing done. It's just another way you could possibly get it. I want to talk now about what we see as therapists in clinic, hallmark signs and symptoms. Now talking from personal experience, it's taken me nearly four to five years to work out what specific infections do to the body. So today we're just going to touch on them as a general snapshot. So stealth infections may affect every system of the body, therefore they can present in many different ways. So classically people that are affected by these guys are, tend to be in a chronic state. They tend to have had a problem for a very long time and it tends to have not been resolved. So for me, um, number one would be widespread unresolved pain. Number two, multi-systems are involved. Now, these, these sorts of symptoms can come in any kind of combination. Sometimes it's one symptom, sometimes it's all of them. Um, commonly affected central nervous systems and peripheral nervous systems. So a lot of brain fog, a lot of problems with memory, um, a lot of sharp shooting pain from maybe into the hands and into the feet. Uh, fatigue is another one. Mood disorders, sensitivities to... Number one would probably be sound, number two would probably be light, chemicals, and then food. Uh, now I've popped in there a really good way of knowing if someone has a self-infection, or potentially could have a self-infection, is knowing that they've had a tick bite, and then it's stuck to them for more than 24 hours, plus they've blown up with a big red rash. Now traditionally Borrelia, or Lyme disease, will can and may, or may or may not, leave a bullseye rash. So if you ever get a patient that's actually had a problem with Lyme or had a tick bite and then blown up with a big bullseye rash, there's a pretty good chance they've contracted that disease and they need to get to the doctor for, for about three to four, five, six, maybe, maybe more um, weeks of antibiotics. Rashes that don't go away or rashes that flare up, rashes that present with mucus, that's another little thing I like to flag in the back of my head. Um, skin lesions. And that's probably, for now, we'll, we'll probably stop with those symptoms because otherwise we're going to get too delved into detail. So basically it's unrelenting, unresolved complaints. If you've got someone with a lot of systems involved, then you need to be sending them off to the doctor. We'll talk more about what kind of doctors we need to send these patients to in a minute. It's really important to recognise that it is a clinical diagnosis. Now because of the nature of these infections, because of their potential to hide from the immune system, it's really important that we become aware of these signs and symptoms because the, the tests don't always let, let us know that they're there. Self-infections are often a clinical diagnosis based on a health history, talking to your patient and understanding how long they've had problems for. B, their symptoms. 
see a clinical presentation. Uh, collections of lab tests are then used to support the diagnosis, which is always made by an experienced doctor. We will probably talk a little bit more about the experienced doctor in a little bit, but let's just say for now, a lot of doctors in Australia have not been taught about stealth infections. They haven't been educated on how to look for them and they don't know how to treat them. So it's really uber important to find a GP that knows how to handle this sort of thing. Um, we've just talked a little bit about signs and symptoms, so we'll talk a little bit about lab work because it does help you understand why the emphasis is placed on a clinical diagnosis. So we'll quickly just scoot through a couple of the methods. We've got direct detection, which is where they isolate the actual organism or its DNA. And then we have serology, where they study antibodies produced in blood. Now I'm going to talk a little about Lyme disease or Borrelia because it's a complex disease for it's complex and it's chronic, but it's also, um, it's actually not really, a lot of the medical people in Australia don't really like to say that it's here. We'll talk about that in a sec as well. But we're going to use Borrelia as an example because it's a complex disease and it's quite tricky to understand. Borrelia itself can change its gen genomic DNA rapidly and because it can do that, PCR testing can often not find it. Direct detection relies on the significant expertise of the interpreting analyst. So again, if you haven't been taught to look for it, you're not going to find it. It's really important that we're using labs that are aware of this bacteria. So antibodies don't usually show up in serology testing. So the typical, like ELISA test that the doctors are using, uh, which is a standard blood test that your doctor will go through and tell you fine because it won't show. The doctors often say that you're fine because these guys don't often pop up in a typical serology test. Now, currently in Australia, testing is based on a two-tiered testing process, which requires a positive ELISA. Uh, as, a as a response before you get the second Western blood. So basically that means that everyone in Australia who thinks they might have Lyme disease or another cell pathogen has to go through a standard process, which is go to the doctor, get a standard blood test, which is usually serology, which usually shows that it's not here, before you can actually proceed to have another test to confirm that you do or you don't have it. Now, just talking about the serology and understanding the, the, the actual way that these infections affect the body, the serology test that we're using in Australia currently for all of these infections, according to this bloke here, have about 40% accuracy. Now, currently in Australia, we're only testing four strands of Borrelia or four strands of Lyme disease. There's actually 130 strands of Lyme disease in Australia and around the world. Now, in Australia, Lyme disease currently isn't a reportable disease, which means when doctors think they've found it, they don't have to actually say that it's here. Okay, now seven forms of Borrelia. Borrelia is something that I want to talk about because it's complex because of how many forms it has. Borrelia is an example of a, of a shape-shifting bacteria. Now for therapists, it's interesting. I've talked to Alan McDonald over in the States and Alan McDonald is a pathologist who studied this bacteria extensively. Now he is telling me that a lot of this bacteria, like the Borrelia bacteria, often morphs from a spiral shape, which is the first form of Borrelia that attacks the blood and hides into, like it morphs from blood and hides in other parts of the body. So it's important to know about Borrelia because no other lab test other than the autopsy is informative about the status of the sanctuary site. So basically Borrelia likes to hide in sanctuary sites of the body. And recent research has found, us, um, found that Borrelia hides in the brain, the eye, the gonad, fascia and ligaments and tendons. So serology doesn't pick this sort of thing up and it's hard for a PCR test to pick this up as well. So I'm hoping that the talk today is starting to get you guys thinking about possible differentials for people that present with chronic pain and chronic illness. By considering stealth infections as a, as a differential, soft tissue therapists can achieve great things for their patient. And understanding and being aware of stealth infections offers, them, offers, us, offers our patients an alternative diagnosis which means they can have the option of having a successful treatment plan. We can tailor soft tissue therapy and treatment plans around these treatment plans that the patients are on. However, there's little research to date to support this. By identifying and recognising that these stealth infections could be present in some of our patients means that they've got a good chance of getting better quickly. And in some cases, we can actually reverse early neurodegenerative changes. So I want to just quickly touch on a case study that we found in clinic the other well, probably two, three weeks ago, I've seen a patient that actually had MS, or well, she had what was called um, relapsing remitting MS. So we've actually found that some of the infections in her have caused some of the lesions on her brain to appear, and through antibiotic treatment, the lesions have been able to go away. 
we've been able to knock them out completely and that's been shown on a CT scan and an MR and a spec scan so that's really cool. A lot of the case studies that I'm following all around Australia have been case studies that have been stuck in wheelchairs. Now since the diagnosis of a stealth infection and most of them are Lyme, have been Lyme patients, they've been able to get out of their wheelchairs and get back to living just through having these infections treated, which is really, which is really quite impressive. Education and awareness of stealth infections leads to various positive outcomes relative to the soft tissue industry. So here I am today talking about stealth infections, trying to create a little bit of awareness. It is a pretty rogue topic, it is quite foreign to most people, however, just by understanding that this could be a differential diagnosis, we could be providing better results for our patients. For me personally, it's broadened my industry scope. Um, I still feel like I'm still working as a soft tissue therapist, however, I'm asking a few different questions. It's increased my referral network personally, I'm just talking from personal experience. Now I'm working with GPs, I'm working with specialists, I'm working with people over in the States, and that's really special. It's helped me grow as a therapist, and I'm hoping that some of this information today might actually set some alarm bells off for, for people in the room. Boost industry recognition. So I'm thinking if you know, generally, as therapists, if we can start to recognise these signs and symptoms, we're going to leave a nice impact for doctors if we go about it the right way. Now, I'm just going to touch on uh, my perspective. So, I'm the researcher that I've been able to do uh, and find and see and learn from. These chronic stealth infections have been known to trigger pain and inflammatory responses. So, this basically means when I'm working away on a fibro patient and I can't get a result, I have an understanding now. I can actually go, wait a minute, maybe it's not my treatment, maybe there's an infection or an infectious process here causing some of this pain. So, you know, you can work, 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 work on fibro patients or MS patients and that not actually achieve a lot of, you know, you can't get them out of pain, that's what I'm trying to say. And now it's nice to understand that I'm not meant to be fixing this patient, the doctor is. Stealth infections such as Borrelia hide in sanctuary zones of the human body such as fascia, tendons and ligaments. That's a pretty bold statement and I'm like thinking, wow, this is fresh research, this is really exciting. However, I'm not convinced because there hasn't been a lot of studies done on it. Um, it's important all the same for a soft tissue uh, therapist to place emphasis on health history, signs and symptoms, clinical presentation and understand how these various infections may present. Now, I'm not asking for everyone to run up and go Google self-infections today. I'm simply asking you guys to just be aware. Um, it does come into the health history most of the time and acknowledging that you're not getting results and acknowledging that you may need to refer your patient off to somebody else, particularly somebody who knows what they're talking about. Soft tissue therapy adjunct may beneficially assist with pain management, postural imbalances, cognitive symptoms, proprioception and mood disorders. At this stage there isn't enough research to say how do we treat personal self-infection but at this stage, I've been doing it for about four years, my treatment plans don't really change. However, my awareness and how I go about treating the person changes just a little bit. So what I mean is basically if I found a patient with a self-infection, I'm able to recognise that their pain may not be coming from a trigger point. The pain, well it could be coming from a trigger point, but I'm now able to recognise that the underlying cause of that trigger point could be something way out of my control. You know, it could be that it is a bug triggering an inflammatory response, which is in turn contributing to like um, muscles, like sorry, nerves firing quickly and causing more trigger points than normal. So it's helped me understand that I can't fix everyone. Alright, now I thought I'd throw this case report in. This is a 2012 paper produced by uh, the American Physiotherapy Journal. It's interesting because it's, it's highlighting that body workers spend a larger portion of time with patients other than healthcare professionals. Due to this extended contact and musculoskeletal knowledge that we have, we are able to recognize when something's sus uh, or um, atypical from a musculoskeletal disorder. So I've actually got a couple of patients that aren't responding to treatment plans and not responding to rehab and I've sent them off for some tests and they've come back positive to Lyme, they've come back positive to a couple of uh, infections which has made me wonder that sometimes maybe these infections could be playing a role. We don't know that yet because there hasn't been enough research done. So in many cases in the clinic, we as practitioners could be the first point of call for someone suffering from a stealth infection and they may not know that. We, up until now, haven't known that. It's up to us to be able to ask the questions and find out a little bit of history might not be everyone's cup of tea, but for me it was. Um, as a soft tissue therapist, 
we can and may be the leading role in referring patients for correct diagnosis. And I know that I've probably been, and I'm only talking from personal experience, but I've seen a lot of patients that have seen 16 to 20 practitioners and they're still sick. And I'm happy and I'm really glad that I've been able to recognise that a stealth infection is present and, or may be present and then refer off to a doctor that knew about them. We've come back with positive results and now these patients are now on, or they're now on protocols and they're getting better. Their pain's changing. You know what I mean? Their moods are changing, their headaches are changing, and it's because there was an underlying cause, which was, which was something that we couldn't actually, you know, deal with ourselves. Stealth infections can be considered as an underlying cause to complex conditions and chronic illness. Uh, therefore, it is within our scope as a, as a soft tissue therapist to pursue further studies in this field. Again, this isn't for everyone. I'm into this sort of thing because my family's affected by it. I happen to see a lot of patients affected by chronic pain, chronic illness, and I think this is me. Won't suit everyone, but if everyone can take a little bit of information away from today, I'll be super, super. Now, Michael Powell at the top, he's the rheumatologist that I went to see over in California. He's the guy I took two of my case studies over to see. I spent some serious time with him sitting by his side, watching what he was doing, taking notes, um, and I still, to this day, have him helping me. He's a major mentor to me. So, the rheumatologist thinking outside the circle, practicing functional medicine. If anyone is interested in getting more information about fibro and underlying causes, he's number one. I'd suggest everyone check out his website. Thomas Barodi, he's a, another mentor of mine. He's a gastroenterologist that I've been working with for nearly five years. He's down in Sydney. Um, Dr. Garth Nicholson's website is there as well. Again, if you jump on my website, you can grab a lot of his research for free. And you can also see links to his videos if you're interested in more information. Dr. Alan McDonald, he's doing a lot of research um, with Alzheimer's and Borrelia. Uh, my website's there as well. And then we've got the Australian websites for Lyme disease. And there's a couple of other ones there too. I think that wraps up pretty much everything I have to say today. This is a rather foreign topic to be talking about. I hope I haven't scared anybody. The good news is, is that we have alternative diagnoses. We have differentials that we need to consider. So I'm just hoping that everyone can take a little bit of information from what I've said today, or we'll find it in the booklet, and um, apply to clinical practice. That's it. And with my personal experience with the doctors that I've been interviewing, they do recommend taking antibiotic protocols for most of these infections based on their life cycles and stages. Um, I am working currently with patients that don't want to take antibiotics and are completely against it. Um, however, that's up to them. So the antibiotics themselves, I couldn't talk about them today. That's going to take another three or so sessions to get into, like code protocols. But from what I've learnt, it's necessary for those patients to be on them. It's really important that patients are actually on a really good immune system boost program as well. So supporting the immune system and changing the terrain that the bugs are living in is absolutely crucial. From the protocols that I've been looking at, doxycycline is a pretty common one that they start off on, um, but they do need to be specific. So again, it's outside my scope. I'm not prepared to talk about treatment protocols today, sorry. Absolutely. Cool. There is, and I'd recommend if anyone wants a doctor's list or if anyone needs help with writing letters to doctors and approaching doctors um, to contact me via my email address. I do have a bunch of cards on me. The answer is yes. We've actually got a growing amount of doctors now. When I first started doing this research, we actually had about six in, in the country and I wasn't confident with any of them. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. And sometimes patients are still traveling overseas to get help because they feel like they need to, but there's a lot of great doctors in Australia now. She's found one now, so she's good. Yeah, good. yeah and I actually have a list of... Yeah, I've got a good list of GPs, neurologists, specialists, immunologists. I've got great That's contacts. No, oh, no, okay. it's not free to air that information. Um, if you need a list, please feel free to email me and I'll send it to you. Most, yeah, most of them are bacterial, according to the guys that I've interviewed. Uh, there are some viral infections, however, I haven't specialised in them. I've picked out the three most common found in these illnesses. Hi, I'm Beck Mills, and welcome to Beyond the Band-Aid's premiere series, Invisibly Ill. During part one of the Invisibly Ill series, A Stealth Reality, 
we explore the concept of stealth infections and how they play a vital role in some of the world's most problematic neurodegenerative, neurobehavioral and chronic fatiguing illnesses. I think one way to think of it is when you have chronic infection that adversely affects the brain, it has different effects at different points in a person's life. If it affects fetal development, we see developmental disorders and autism. If it's in midlife, we may see depression, anxiety, cognitive impairments. If it's an early life, it, and sometimes fetal, it, it may show a psychosis like bipolar or schizophrenia. If it's in later life, it can be associated with dementia. But in all those cases, what they have in common is there's a uh, provocation of the immune system and there's close communication between the immune system and the nervous system. It was just as if something had turned off, turned off the Parkinson's and it was just unbelievable. The symptoms, they get so bad and the pain gets so bad that your mindset changes and you actually start to, to want to die and um, you know there's no fear or anything involved it, uh, it, it just becomes too much. I miss being a member of a society, I miss paying taxes, I'm, I miss contributing. You feel like you're trying to prove to people what's actually wrong with you there's just such a lack of understanding about it. No one knows about it in this country and, and no one... Uh, I didn't quite understand it for a long time until Julian slowly taught me about it and I read some information from him and um, then I could have some more insight into his condition because when he told me he was sick, I didn't understand about it either. I thought, well, what, what from a tick, how could you get so sick? It was quite shocking for me that such a... You know, one minute he's fine, the next minute he's going through... Um, He's slowly deteriorating, and he's not one to put things on, so he, he suffered very silently. It hurts um, here and there, and my tummy hurts here, there, and there, and my feet hurts as well. I'd never had any initial symptom, it just hit me so either five to eight years later, just suddenly something knocked me over the edge. Stealth infections are in general uh, bacterial, but in some cases viral infections. They, they get inside and hide inside cells and they can't be seen by the immune system. And that's why they're called stealth infections. Now the most common stealth infections that are related to chronic illnesses are, uh, number one, mycoplasma. Chlamydia pneumoniae, uh, which is very, very common. Um, Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the, one of the causative components of Lyme disease, which is a complex illness involving not only Borrelia, but mycoplasma and other infections as well. Uh, all these infections uh, tend to not only spread throughout the body, but they tend to end up in areas like the central nervous system where they can cause tremendous havoc. The problem that we run into is that Psychiatrists just think of neurotransmitters and immunologists just think of cytokines and immune thing, immune functioning. And there's actually a lot of crosstalk between the immune system and the brain. But there isn't a lot of crosstalk between psychiatrists and immunologists. So despite the fact that I have two positive results from the world's leading Lyme disease specialists, backed up by clinical um, test results uh, which conclusively show that I have Lyme disease. These infectious disease professors here in Australia continue to ignore um, my request for treatment, um, ignore my request for further antibiotics and they send me away. Um, some have questioned my mental state of mind and referred me to psychiatrists. Some have blamed it on um, an allergy to grass. Um, they just look at every other uh, excuse or reason 
um, other than the fact that it's a bacterial infection. These people are causing people like myself a great deal of pain and suffering, which is totally and utterly uh, unnecessary. You're not going to treat Lyme unless you can diagnose Lyme. You're not going to diagnose Lyme unless you think of it. And you, you can only think of it if you know about it. It's kind of, again, it's really simple. Um, that's how it works in medicine. You know, consider this as part of your differential diagnosis. Just add Lyme disease to it. But you have to understand it. So it needs to be taught in medical school. If you look back over history, we've got something like 150 years of medical research that indicated some cancers have been caused by infection. And I think if I was going to pick the infection that best fit, fit that particular list, it would be Mycoplasma fermentans. I think there's a very strong possibility. We know that Helicobacter causes stomach cancer. Now, nobody ever talked about that. We know that Chlamydia and Pneumoniae can trigger off cancers. Mycoplasma fermentans, absolutely, as well. Mycoplasma fermentans has been found in the growing edge of breast cancers, so possibly solid tumours. So there's something like 200 types of mycoplasma. Now, you know, probably 10, 15 would affect humans. I mean, there's a mycoplasma alligatus, which alligators get. We know with mycoplasma fermentans, it switches on oncogenes, it switches on inflammatory cascades, so it shifts our interleukin cascades. I mean, it's a really nasty, nasty little bacteria. I mean, we're a, a laboratory. We, we need to have a doctor ask us to do a particular test. We don't go out and find patients and tell them we want to test them. Well, saying Lyme disease doesn't exist in Australia, but it exists in America, is like saying white shark attacks are only in Australia and they're not in America. It's, it's good for our tourism, or it's good for our belief system, but the reality is that when we look at it, these, these are infections that are worldwide, and they've been found on every continent except Antarctica, and probably would be there if you look long enough. The evidence in Australia so far goes back as far as 1959, when McCarris uh, looked at our wildlife and identified a Borrelia species on morphology, or the characteristic physical form of the bacteria um, as a Borrelia species in wallabies, kangaroos and bandicoots. And then there was a further publication by Carly and Pope in 1962 who actually isolated a Borrelia species and based again on the physical characteristics of the spirochete they identified a novel species and called it Borrelia queenslandica. So not only are people returning positives for Borrelia they're also returning positives against Babesia and Rickettsia and Ehrlichia and Anaplasma. So there are other tick-borne pathogens that are on board as well. So we need a broader research span and the clinicians need to be aware of this when they are investigating their patients. I'm Beck Mills. I, um, I'm a soft tissue therapist based in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. When people ask me why I got interested and what started all of this for me, I just I think back to 2009 when I first stumbled across a patient who suffered from fibromyalgia. This patient had seen 16, 16 or so doctors and specialists around Australia and spent, I think she said something like $30,000, $40,000 on trying to find answers. When she did come to the point of telling me that she travelled overseas to see a fibromyalgia specialist, I was just like, wow, that's such a long way to travel. But then she actually started to tell me about what he was treating and what he was looking for. So a little alarm bell went off inside of me and I was just like, I started to buzz. I knew straight away that hearing about chlamydia ammonia, hearing about toxins, hearing about deficiencies, you know, hearing about all these infections and how they play a role in and why they play a role just made so much sense. Getting to the bottom of these illnesses early could save lives and I think that's really important to sort of keep in mind. Screening for stealth infections is not taught in medical school and I think it should be. This amount of information that's now available that suggests that these infections play a causal role is just incredible. Bob Bransfield, the psychiatrist, I found him incredibly interesting to talk to. Garth Nicholson, wow, what he has to bring uh, I think that these two probably, you know, 
hit out of the park with a lot of their research and what they've put together. The idea of the human body just being made up of microbes, it makes sense. Working in such an industry where you're exposed to so many different kinds of people and so many different kinds of pain is so challenging. Once you learn about these infections and you learn about other toxins and you learn about how the combination of toxins and deficiencies and infections play a role in some of these chronic, these chronic illnesses, it just makes so much sense and you, and you feel like you need to tell people about it. It's just joining the dots. You know, it's definitely time to start changing the way that we think if we want to start beating these diseases.